Well, I'm, I'm going to do my, uh, my discussion in English so that uh, Mark can uh, properly understand probably. Yes, uh, thank you. Merci. Uh, I have to say I, I, I very much like to paper. Uh, as you focus, I think, on a, on a very understudied question in the library theory, namely the link between theory of democracy and the relationship of citizens to politics, and more precisely, uh, you tackle the question of how can we imagine from a normative perspective the coming of a truly deliberative democracy when citizens have such a negative image of politics and see politics as corrupted and are so distrustful. How is deliberative democracy possible if citizens have such a negative perception of politics? So you start with a, with a paradox, stressing that there is this widely shared belief uh, among citizens uh, in Western society, according to which politicians and political systems are corrupted and deceitful, while they are relatively clean, uh, at least more clean than other regimes, and cleaner than they used to be. And, and the main answer you give to this paradox is to argue that this distrust comes from the corruption of language itself. Um, it comes from the way language is used in politics, and especially by politicians, and from the corruption of, of political discourse itself. Um, your argument is that a corrupted language corresponds to the, the corruption of the relationship between words and the commitments that follow from them. Uh, basically, a corrupted speaker is a speaker that do not meet the expect expectations deriving from his language. And this is especially the case uh, for politics, which is made of conflicts, uh, participants to political discussions being often adversaries and adopting a strategic behavior, uh, and therefore appearing always strategically motivated and interesting. So whether the corruption of language is especially salient in, in politics. Uh, and basically, to, to answer uh, this, uh, this, this challenge uh, for, for democracy, uh, you offer an answer which is, in some sense, uh, that we need to promote uh, non-corrupted use of language, we, we, we have to, in a way, uh, and I'll come back to that, make democracy more deliberate. Uh, and, and I'd like to, uh, to ask you some questions about that. First of all, uh, how can we explain that this feeling of corruption and the massive distrust with politics is more important today than before? While the corruption of language you point out has always existed, is in some sense uh, in the structure of the use of language and you show it in, the, in your discussion of Plato, Hobbes, or the philosophy of language more, more generally. Is this linked to the fact that democracy has become more deliberative recently, and that the use of language is more central now in, in democracy than ever before? And this is probably one of the reasons. But what I'm wondering is that, is this enough? And aren't there other uh, explanations and reasons to understand why there is such a massive distrust with political language today? And basically my question would be, uh, isn't your approach overly logocentric or overly focused on language to explain uh, citizens' distrust uh, with politics? Um, aren't there some extra-linguistic reasons for the distrust of citizens with politics and political language? And I'd, I'd like to, uh, to, ta to tackle one of these of this extra-linguistic reasons, I think, uh, of this uh, distrust with political language. One of the, of the reasons, I think, of this um, distrust with political language uh, is the decline of the identification of citizens to their political representatives, namely uh, the, the trust in uh, political language does not come only from the content of language but also from who actually speaks. And the uh, increasing gap and social gap, uh, cultural gap between uh, the citizenry and political elites could be one of the reasons uh, why uh, there is a, uh, an increased uh, distrust with, with, with political language. So one of the, of, of the reasons of this distrust could be, uh, out, should be, uh, I think, looked for outside of, of language itself. But more, dis more deeply, uh, hasn't this distrust with political language to do with the structural transformation of politics in the recent years? And I especially think uh, that beyond the corruption of language itself, the decline of the political capacities of, of governments has had a huge impact on the capacity of politicians to meet their promises and to be trusted. Uh, due to globalization, uh, due to the increasing power of financial markets and rating agencies, due to uh, multi-level local governance, uh, the political capacities of government have declined in such a way that it's harder than before, probably for politicians, to meet the expectations that is placed in their uh, language and words. 
Um, so I, I would tend to argue, and I would like to, to hear your answer on this point, uh, that the, the, the wide distrust with politics, uh, to, be, to be fully understa understood, uh, we, we need to have a, probably a linguistic, but also an extra uh, linguistic uh, approach. Finally, uh, I'd like to tackle the concrete means you propose to, uh, to face the corruption of, of language and the distrust with, with, with politics. And you mentioned three uh, at, the, at, the, at the end of your presentation. Uh, first, inclusion of citizens in decision-making processes, and especially of veto players. Then, representation, and especially the enlargement of representation to, to other actors, and especially to citizen representatives. And then the improvement of citizens' capacities of judgment to better judge the actual level of corruption of, of the political system. And we might agree with, with the answers, but, but there is some problems, however, I think. Because basically, uh, your argument is that to fight distrust with politics, uh, we should make democracy more deliberative in creating new deliberative and, and uh, inclusive uh, deliberative arenas, such as mini publics. However, uh, there is, I think, some problems with that, in the sense that uh, most people who actually participate in these many publics uh, who engage in deliberative politics are probably the least uh, distrustful with politics. And just like the most critical citizens uh, are, are those who uh, will hardly ever participate in these activities. And, uh, and those who actually are the more critical of political language and, and, uh, and distrustful with politics in general uh, have a pretty critical perspective on, on deliberative politics. And, uh, and because they are uh, organized and set up by politicians for, for whom they have little uh, trust, uh, they also have little confidence and trust in, in, uh, in deliberative many publics. And the, um, so, so there is a problem here. Then another, another problem with giving, let's say, deliberative solutions to uh, distrust with, uh, with, with politics, I think, uh, is that, and uh, this is also my experience as a, as a field researcher on many publics, is that very often, and this is probably not the case uh, for British Columbia, but very often uh, many publics produce more distrust uh, than trust in the end. Uh, for, for many reasons, but maybe because uh, the... Um, there is a, uh, also, in the organization of many publics, a huge uh, gap between what is actually uh, uh, said by, by politicians when uh, organizing them and what they actually do of them. Basically, uh, the, the cynicism and distrust uh, resulting from many publics and deliberative initiatives mostly come from the, the wide discourse of politicians that uh, deliberative, uh, deliberative many publics will actually empower uh, citizens, will actually uh, change the the, the repartition and, and, and the distribution of power in society, while in the end, uh, most of these mini publics have little impact on, on, uh, on decisions and public policies. And this gap between words and deeds in the very organization of, of deliberative initiative create wide distrust uh, for, 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 uh, for this. So you have two solutions, basically, in this case. It's either stopping to pretend that mini publics will have an impact and say, okay, they won't, and so probably this will avoid uh, massive distress, or empowering deliberative democracy to meet the actual standards and discourses of politicians. But then, if this question of empowerment is, is, is probably, and, and, and the answer you want to give to, um, to political distrust is uh, to go beyond uh, mere institutional arrange, uh, arrangements and procedural uh, solutions to distrust, but to, to focus really on the distribution of power in society, and. To, uh, to, to, to question this, uh, this distribution of power in, uh, in relation to, to many publics. So that's my question, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just give a, a yeah. couple of uh, responses. Um, thanks for these great uh, comments and suggestions. Uh, the um, first set of suggestions uh, about the structural transformations that uh, alter the nature of the corrup corruption problem, uh, I just accept all of those. <laughs> uh, I do think that there is something to moving to more talk-based forms of politics that also, uh, um, I don't know, peaks mm -hmm. uh, a particular sense of vulnerability, which uh, gives a, a place for a certain kind of discourse of corruption, uh, but absolutely on these structural changes. Uh, the one thing I think I would say there is that the, the challenge for uh, many, of, many of our older institutions is to uh, move from sort of central management position to uh, 
uh, sort of chief negotiator positions uh, that are much more discursive. So, uh, you know, parliaments and parties and so on uh, really need to reinvent themselves for these, these new uh, sort of structural realities. Um, on this, uh, the, the, the question of many publics and the question of whether or not many publics tend to select for people who, who are already engaged in politics. Uh, there's a very neat article published about um, a year, a year and a half ago by uh, Michael uh, Nablow and uh, some of his colleagues uh, called uh, Who Wants to Deliberate? And the, the very interesting finding in this article was that the people who are most interested in deliberation are the ones who are most alienated from uh, sort of normal politics. And so, no, but, find, pardon? No, I mean, just like we, we can talk about that later, right? Okay. But like, I, I think there's some empirical questions there. Okay. No, no. Um, yeah, I'd be interested in that. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but it's an interesting hypothesis, right? The different. Uh, at least the different uh, kinds of venues might pick up uh, citizens who are not picked up by the uh, uh, sort of normal channels of, of politics. Uh, and then finally on this question of whether many publics produce more distrust, uh, absolutely. I mean, if you, uh, the sort of professionals who do this kind of stuff will say that it's better not to do uh, a many public event uh, than to do it badly. Uh, if you do it badly, you create uh, cynicism uh, where there wasn't cynicism before. And in BC, you know, we had a great example of this. The, the province spent five and a half million dollars on a pretty good uh, thing with the British Columbia Citizens Assembly. A couple years later, they spent twelve million dollars on a process called the Conversation on Health. Uh, the government had a kind of uh, uh, health sustainability agenda. Uh, they screwed up the selection process. Uh, they uh, had, there was a vague mandate, uh, you know, the, the unions jumped in and, and grabbed the agenda. Uh, the, there was widespread suspicion that really what the government was doing was trying to generate uh, political support for decisions that they had already made. And uh, it was, uh, so the government uh, spent uh, $12 million to produce uh, much more cynicism than there had been before. So <laughs> you know, it's really possible to screw these things up. And it's especially possible to screw these things up by, uh, this is the kind of first stop from, uh, by uh, politicians very often, or, or uh, decision makers who believe they need more legitimacy. They, they consult, right? They put together a process, and they uh, 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 manage the agenda in such a way that they can get legitimacy, they think, for the decisions that they would take anyway. Uh, they're often surprised that it doesn't work out that way. Uh, and they produce uh, more distrust. Uh, yes, I have two questions. First, I I'm not sure how we can uh, define um, insincere speech or deceptive speech as coercion and uh, truthful or sincere speech as non-coercion. Because, of course, deceptive speech does yield power, but it's also the case of sincere speech. All forms of speech can influence people in various ways. So when you're deliberating and you're advancing an argument, you're saying this argument is valid, but you also have to leave it to the person to decide if it is valid. And it's, in a way, it is the same when you make a commitment. You're saying, I'm making this commitment, I'm telling you I am sincere, but I'm, I also have to leave it to you to decide if you think I am sincere or mm -hmm. not. So I'm not saying uh, the two situations are similar, but I don't see how in one case we have coercion and in one case we don't. Can you say a little bit more about that uh, point? Sure. Can I jump in yes. on this question, yeah. if I may? Uh, because, I, 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 because I think it might be actually quite... Okay, sorry. yeah, I was in fact tempted to make, to ask the same question. How, how would you draw the line between acceptable persuasion and deceit? Or oh, that, I think, is the, the mm. issue. When you want to persuade, you said convincingly that in deceiving, we are getting people to act against their will. Their will. That's grand, that's sound, that's in, indeed what we are achieving. So deceit is one way of getting people to act against their will. Now, in persuading people, we're also trying to get people to act in certain ways that we think they should. <laughs> so. What's the difference? The difference is that in persuasion, there's no deceit. Well, okay, that is the, it's, it may be a mere reformulation, 
what Charles said, no? Yeah, well, I mean, it's the same ID. <laughs> I was seeking <laughs> approval. I was seeking, is this correct? Yeah, well, I do agree. Well, I mean, you know, one, one of the sort of easy things to say is that um, in, in the case of persuasion, the person whose persuasion should kind of know what's going on, know what the agenda is, know what the stakes are, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, the speaker is trying to exercise influence, but it's a kind of influence that is exactly the kind of influence that you want uh, in a deliberative democracy. I know. Right? That's why so, I'm asking the question. Okay, so, <laughs> but, but, um, but I don't quite see how this then relates to the question of sincerity and insincerity. Because some, somebody who is persuading, presumably, is, you know, they're, they're really trying to win the argument, and they're really sincerely trying to do that. And this, you know, this kind of a fair game with respect to the, the uh, other uh, participants in the, uh, you know, in the, in the, the interchange. Um, is this if, a question of sincerity, you think? Is it the intention of the speaker? Because you know, persuasion, you know, since, yeah. you know, time immemorial has always involved some kind of, um, I wouldn't say insincere speech, but um, using the words that you think will lead people to act okay. in the way you wish, right? And the, so we, I'm not saying that you cannot draw that line, but I think that some care has to be devoted mm -hmm. to drawing that line very carefully. I think that's right, and I can now, now see that there's probably a, a, a missing piece to the argument, that I, or I, there's a piece that I didn't emphasize uh, clearly and closely enough. So the, it seems to me that the discourse of corruption takes uh, sort of everyday sincerity quite seriously. And, and I think it's simply true that most people view most other people as relatively sincere when they... Uh, you know, they say, well, I'm going to show up at 9 o'clock. Uh, uh, they come in at uh, 9.15, and uh, they explain that the, you know, the metro was crowded, right, and so on and so forth. I mean, you, you know, all, this is kind of how you get stuff done. Okay, so I think people take that kind of everyday expectation of sincerity, and they, they apply the standard to politicians. Right. Now, on the one hand, I want to say that uh, it's not a bad thing to apply this kind of standard to politicians. On the other hand, I want to say that once you transform this into a political domain, you're into a domain of language used for purposes of winning and losing. And you're also into a domain where it's often hard to tell uh, just how sincere someone is, right? And so that's the point at which you want to probably back off of questions of sincerity and insincerity, <coughs> although I think this language will always be used, mm -hmm. uh, and ask about what kinds of institutions will tend to cause political speakers to abide by the commitments that they uh, hold out in public. Uh, you know, this may, uh, this probably does um, uh, connect, although in ways that I haven't fully thought through, with uh, Jan Elster's talk yesterday on the civilizing force, yes, force yes. of hypocrisy. But most of the things that I sort of said at the end were sort of devices to um, stand in for uh, judgments of, secure, uh, of sincerity, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And I don't know if that, does that get it? Uh, and, uh, on a, at the issue? Yeah, on a related topic, it, I think it's uh, more, it's related. Um, how do you decide in a specific situation when speech is corrupted or is not? Because we, I guess we don't want to say that speech is corrupted as soon as someone lies somewhere. Well, I mean, so if you think about, I mean, if you think about um, sort of the everyday cases, uh, um, people build up their credibility really uh, sort of um, almost instinctively and carefully over the period of lifetime. And you tend, you know, people, uh, move away from somebody who's sort of been caught out in the deceit or a lie uh, pretty quickly. Uh, it's very hard for sort of everyday social actors to recover from, uh, from uh, 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 deceitful, um, uh, um, you know, uh, behaviors once they've been caught out. Um, you know, in the case of politics, um, I mean, there are, you know, one of the things that uh, a system that hedges, as I put it, hedges against sort of the corruption of language does is it uh, 
uh, produces pretty high penalties for uh, for actors who are sort of caught straight, you know, straight out or red-handed in the seats. Um, this, this sort of gray area of sort of um, you know uh, manipulating or shading or dissimulating or these sorts of things. Uh, we, there we want our institutions to kind of um, enable people to sort of peg down these actors of uh, which they're going to have to rely on once they uh, commit to something that's actionable. Okay, let me So um, I'm, I'm struck by, um, well, I, I'd, I'd like to invite you to reflect a little bit, you know, uh, on how uh, thoroughgoing I think the reform of democratic institutions would have to be in order for, I mean, you, 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 you pointed to some devices that might be, uh, you know, sort of fingers in the dike, as it were. But, um, I mean, think of things like, uh, we talked about yesterday about, about things like party discipline, right? Uh, you know, we, have, we organize uh, democracies around political parties, and very often political parties require of people that they talk insincerely, that they toe the party line. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that I, to say toe the party line sounds uh, dismissive, and, but, you know, there are good democratic reasons, maybe not deliberative democratic reasons, but democratic reasons for political discipline to be imposed in certain contexts. Think of electoral politics, right? I mean, uh, in a mass media age, um, you know, could Barack Obama have been elected if the high sounding uh, sort of, you know, yes, we can, yes, we, you know, I mean, it was very inspiring, but on the, on, on the other hand, not terribly sort of contentful. Uh, but had he just said, you know, had he, had he just spoken the way that he sometimes very respectfully speaks to American citizens, treating them like adults and saying, you know, this is what we can do, this is what we can't do, we're going to try to achieve bipartisanship, whatever, you know, he probably wouldn't have gotten elected um, uh, president. So think of electoral politics, think of party discipline. Um, well, just think of those two things. So I, I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's not a criticism uh, necessarily, but just an invitation to think of how thoroughgoing the reform of democratic institutions would have to be in order for a sort of randomian agenda uh, to take hold. Okay. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, 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 no, I have a long list of people already. Okay. So, uh, yeah, just, just, uh, just very quickly, I mean, the, the, these, these points are all uh, well taken, but uh, uh, and the reforms would have to uh, be quite thoroughgoing. Uh, I'm not a fan of party discipline precisely because it uh, demands the sincerity of representatives. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, and, and I'm a little bit, um, you know, I'm, I'm not terribly troubled by the, the sort of uh, yes we can stuff. Uh, Barack Obama is quite capable of filling, filling that in. But generally speaking, uh, it seems to me that we have a kind of, um, there's an interesting and maybe productive quandary, which is that uh, people will continue to take these expectations from sort of, uh, I would say, sort of everyday speech through which they regulate everyday relationships and apply them to a domain where these expectations are much more problematic. And, and the problem of, of institutional design is to try to figure out what is going to stand in for our inability to expect sincerity in the same way that we expect it in uh, sort of uh, everyday interactions. And part of that formula will have to do with incentives for people who speak politically to uh, uh, stand by their commitments. Mm -hmm. Brian. Uh, well, I found this in uh, incredibly interesting. Uh, I was wondering about um, one more radical alternative um, explanation for the sense people have of politics being corrupt that you described, which should be not tied so much to the corrupt uses of speech or the, the insincere or deceptive or uh, strategic uses of speech, but simply to the um, increasing amount of speech in politics, of any speech. And that would be, um, well, f famously, if one looks in the US at the <coughs> office of the presidency, the number of speeches uh, addressed to the public has grown enormously in the course of our history. And if one looks in general at the amount of speech d directed at ordinary citizens, it's uh, grown exponentially. And uh, in any sort of speech, the divergence between speech and action, or the fact that um, speech never seems to fully account for the real um, mo motivations behind actions, um, that becomes more and more apparent the more you're exposed to speech in general. And so that would be an even um, well, slightly different diagnosis, and I just wonder um, what you would think of that. 
two uh, comments linked. Uh, one is to pick up this larger conversation and try to distinguish the way Nate Kemp uh, at, from Princeton um, did between pure communicative action, which is good, strategic action, which is neutral, and manipulative speech, uh, which is uh, uh, negative. Um, and manipulative would be the intent to deceive, a clear intent to deceive. We, we all agree that that's a bad thing. So um, and pure communicative, and act, oh, that's a good thing. So now strategic, um, there you have an attempt to respond, taking into consideration anticipated reactions. Mm -hmm. That's the strategic part of it, the anticipated reactions. So the words right to life or right to choice mm -hmm. are meant to, are, are coined because they are seen to create uh, mindsets in the, mm -hmm. in the heads of people who hear them. And similarly, I think, uh, Mark, Yes, We Can uh, has that uh, quality. Now, those can be, uh, uh, you said, filled in. Um, we, one might say, more philosophically, those can be redeemed. That is to say, you can say to a right-to-life person, what do you mean? And they'll spell out why they think people have, you know, why the embryo has a right to blah, 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 and get into a whole set of, I mean, presuming that they're sophisticated enough to be able to do this, they can do this. And similarly with quotes, right to choice, that person can redeem that with a, in the same way that you say is good. So this shouldn't be a problem. But I think what people find the, in the, this problem is that um, I'm walking along, so to speak, somebody says right to choice, that triggers Choice, choice, yes, I like choice, 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 choice. Um, and so I'm in favor of that. Um, and I don't think further. There is, I don't ask for it to be redeemed. And so I'm, I sort of walk forward with a, now a positive concept of this, choice, 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 or life, 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 you know, whatever it might be. And I'm brought into that fold without um, actually understanding the part that could be hypothetically redeemed, but is not redeemed. Um, so that's, so let me just hold that for a moment. And then this, my second question brings in Bernard. Because yesterday, Bernard, I, uh, when you brought up, um, you argued yesterday for introducing contradiction into deliberation. Uh, through various mechanisms. And I asked at the end of the talk whether parties and partisanship uh, could play a positive role in structuring deliberation to bring out these contradictions. And we didn't struggle with that very much. But now today, Mark presents an argument why parties and partisanship should, uh, m might play a negative role in that. Because they, parties and partisanship have incentives to use language in this somewhat corrupt way to suggest messages that um, are either not redeemable or in, intended not to be redeemed. In, they're redeemable, but the intent yeah, yeah, yeah. to redeem is, is not really there. The intent is only to sort of create a positive uh, reaction. So that they, they crap the politicians and political activists. And one reason I, I got out of political activism was I thought I couldn't um, make a living at it. But the other reason was that, um, I, uh, I, I got up, upset at people not caring. Um, for example, you know, a piece of survey research that shows women are raped every minute. Well, um, it, how good is that survey research? That was not of great interest to the activists that I was working with. Um, the, it was just a neat piece of research. It was out there. You could get it from some standard uh, publication. That's all anybody needed. Um, because the goal was to change minds, persuade people, and here was this piece of research that had a good pedigree. And the appropriate question was not, was the piece of research done well, but could we protect ourselves if this piece of research was challenged? And the answer was yes, because it had a good pedigree. So it's not just politicians that do this, it's political activists too, it's the entire structure of a, a debate to win. So I think that Bernard, I'd like to ask Bernard and, and, and uh, Mark to kind of come, come to, to, to talk about this, you know, just to spend one minute here in front of us. Um, 
uh, s sort of saying how you think you can get Bernard's contradictions yeah. okay. without people taking the roles which would then lead them into, st into strategic speech which is not intended to be redeemed. I was uh, quite persuaded by Bernard's uh, talk yesterday, and after what you say, I'm now uh, even more persuaded. Um, and I think this is the, this is the avenue to uh, uh, redeeming uh, competition uh, as a way of, um, of flushing out uh, potentially manipulative uh, language. Uh, and what you want is for that manipulative, you, you want to uh, disincentivize manipulative language that can't be redeemed, right? That there, that there couldn't be commitments that follow from it. Uh, you want uh, institutions that produce incentives uh, uh, for uh, strategic language to be uh, cashed out. And so I think what we're looking for are uh, institutional incentives that uh, function in a way that is equivalent to the everyday sincerity demands, but can't be um, written directly onto the political because it is an essentially strategic context or something like that. And uh, one of the, the devices is, um, is uh, going to be, I think, uh, uh, confrontation of, of, say, two strategic frames. Um, now, you know, if it turns out that the strategic frames end up with two sort of uh, packages of reasons, uh, there's not, there, there is no way in which that is corrupt under this description, right? The corruption is going to be in the, uh, the uh, uh, mismatch between what you say and your uh, intention to, uh, to cash it out. And even a strategic act actor ought to be able to do that. And better institutions should incentivize uh, strategic actors to do that. That's maybe a little foggier than I meant it to be, but um, now uh, maybe Bernard can uh, well, no, 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 redeem. No, no. Just, and this is turning a conference into a seminar, but just maybe you know one thought on the question of persuasion and deceit. There is. Uh, we, I think, we are committed to the view as deliberative Democrats that persuasion is acceptable and good, right? And that deceit is not. So maybe, this is just tentative, we could draw the line in the following way. When I'm trying to persuade you, I'm trying to change your preference with your consent. There's, I'm, in other words, I'm trying to change your will. Well, if I'm manipulating you, I'm trying to change your preference unbeknownst to you, unbeknownst or against your, con your consent. If this is, it in part, I don't know that it exactly addresses Jenny's question. This is more along the lines of a contribution to the conversation on these matters. Uh, I would, yeah, all right. For what it's worth. Okay. Uh, Madam, we have. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was just uh, to follow up on Brian's uh, word. Uh, you mentioned that one possibility to watch out of what the uh, the content of the uh, if if the politicians were deceiving was one solution was to have veto players, what you call veto mm -hmm. players, or what can we call watchdogs or whatever. Uh, one can notice that recently on the internet has blossomed uh, organisms like that, indie medias or actors or bloggers who after every important political discourse try to analyze it and try to see, well, if they're being insincere or maybe not, or maybe even worse, if they are being incompetent because they, they just didn't know what they were talking about, which actually happens a lot, and maybe more than them being insincere sometimes. So, do you think that the profusion and the blossoming of those organizations is actually helping out? I'm not really sure. I think it participates to exactly what Brian has said, basically that a profusion, there's a profusion of discourses and it makes, politics, uh, I mean, uh, the political system looks even more um, 
I don't know, maybe a, a bit, bit more um, uh, dark, obscure, or abstruse maybe than it is. And I'm not sure it's really helping out. Yeah, so that, that, that's another one that I would like to um, think through uh, a little bit more before um, uh, giving a, a, a good response. Um, as, as kind of a little bit of theor theoretical background, I would say that um, to the degree that uh, political actors um, uh, live up to their commitments and show themselves to be relatively trustworthy and so on and so forth, um, you would hope that citizens would be a little bit more trusting and give a little bit more latitude, which allows uh, political actors to operate with a little bit more finesse when they're constantly being monitored and watched and so on and so forth, uh, I think that they probably can't be very intelligent as representatives or leaders, and I think that's probably the fear that, that you're suggesting. Um, the, um, the trick is to figure out uh, what uh, uh, relationship there should be between uh, monitoring and trusting. Um, you know, if it turns out that somebody's monitored, 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 and it turns out that they are always, uh, 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 you know, it turns out that they, you know, that they're pretty much doing what they say, and and, and the monitoring isn't picking up very much, um, you would get a little bit boring, right? Uh, but but I know what you're talking about, and that I don't have a much better um, response than that. Oh, not a bad. Three brief questions. Why do you exclude uh, the corruption of references of truth, uh, think to the works of, for example, Jörg Steiner or Gary Mulcheroni or, or Quirk, going beyond discourse ethics in assessing legislative uh, deliberation? Why do you stay on this kind of uh, contractualism? That's the first question. And the second question is connected with the, the Charles question. Uh, which normative frame do you take to test the corruption? Is it only linguistic or ethical or political or epistemic? Or, and how do you articulate them, if you articulate them? So, so the first question again is... Uh, Why, what, you've excluded in, in the beginning of, of your uh, uh, presentation the, the corruption of references, and you, 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 right. you have in mind truth. And so you, you stay on a kind of contractualism. You have to be sincere only. Uh, it's a kind of uh, Rawlsian, uh, Habermasian. Uh, everybody wants only uh, to, to take seriously the, and, and to save the, the, the coordination among, uh, among act actors. But you can uh, be interesting by the reference of that and the words mm -hmm. and the truth of what you are speaking of. The, um, I mean, I pretty much buy into the, um, uh, it's true, uh, a Habermasian view of how it is that, um, that uh, uh, reason is generated. Uh, referential theories of truth um, uh, almost always slide into, at least in politics, into the question of, of uh, uh, who is going to pronounce. But, um, but the pronouncements, uh, unless they're generating discursively some kind of authority uh, that has uh, epistem epist epistemic weight, uh, when they are um, uh, applied, as it were, in society, uh, it will always be experienced as authoritarian by the people to, to, to whom these, these are applied. Uh, you know, it's not sort of accidental that um, Plato has a, um, uh, a theory of truth that uh, references natural kinds and prefers philosopher kings. Um, there's a relationship between that way of finding the truth and, uh, and that way of organizing a society that's rational. So, so that's, the, uh, what, that's the complex that um, I would like to avoid uh, in part by pointing out that the problem of corruption is not, <clears throat> as Plato and Hobbes believe, um, that uh, referential theories of truth are coming apart. Um, the, um, you know, I, I could probably say a little bit more about the, um, the, um, the, the second part if you would articulate the, uh, the question again. When you test it, is it only on a linguistic basis 
or on a scientific basis, or it could be on political basis. Yeah, this is, <laughs> the, the framework is really, it, it, it's universal pragmatics. It's about uh, the conditions under which claims can be, um, can be redeemed and have force. Yeah, exactly. No, 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 the question is, um, so I would like to go back to the example that you gave about the train. So you, we expect the train to come at night, and then it comes, the train arrives at 9.15, so it's more or less the same, but we can see whether or not, you know, we were right to, ex to, to be trustful in, t in the metro system. And I think one of the problems in politics today is, is just uh, uh, the generality of, of of propositions or policies or claims, it's very difficult to know what would be the equivalent of the train arrived at 9.15. And actually sometimes the, so even the, the, the proposition of trying to figure out what would be an equivalent that, and so that we could say, ah, uh, you know, the promise has been uh, redeemed um, or the claim has been redeemed, uh, can have actually perverse effects. So, so for instance, some politicians, uh, to give an example in Quebec, um, uh, the government wants to say we are doing something for uh, education in uh, elementary schools. So we are going to buy computers, you know, we are doing something important. Uh, we are going to buy computers uh, for, or, or we are going to introduce English uh, in first grade for everyone. Uh, that's an easy promise to make in a sense because after two years you can check whether it has been uh, redeemed or not, whether it is the best way to ascertain whether or not uh, the government has done something or has done what it needs to do to solve issues in education is another question. But governments like these kinds of plan because they are easy to put into place and then you can sh they can show themselves to be trustworthy. But I'm not sure that that's the kind of thing we necessarily want to. So I'm just wondering about the possible perverse uh, effects of that. Okay. Uh, and then there's no, not much a question. It's, it's an ad, uh, I just want to add to the list of problems that you still have to solve in order to uh, validate your very interesting framework. Uh, the, uh, these problems come from my experience in international negotiations where you have people who behave strategically and they really want to manipulate uh, their uh, adversaries, uh, people who are not becoming to belonging to the same political community. Uh, first problem is the, uh, uh, you may have a situation where the aggregation of uh, insincere and strategic speech may eventually end up into an acceptable decision. So people are trying to manipulate their uh, adversaries, but eventually the decision is optimal. And this is something which, secondly, is going to be accepted post hoc. And th then you have a time problem, which applies as well as uh, to, to uh, local uh, negotiations or, or deliberations, because people may, uh, uh, again, try to make their views uh, validated by others, and eventually it doesn't work. But uh, later on, uh, the final decision is uh, uh, considered as something which is good. And the third problem, very shortly, is that strategic players may uh, trigger uh, um, some very interesting uh, uh, and sincere uh, speeches, and then they are trapped by their own uh, uh, by their own device because they they started to launch something and they wanted to manipulate, and eventually it comes out with something which is very consensual, and they have to accept it. This happens, for example, during the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations when the Palestinians found out that when the Palestinians found out that uh, not trying to uh, oppose the Israeli any time, but just sometimes saying that you're right, you already said it in the previous session, so now we can apply it, your own principle to that session. And the Israeli came out with the answer, I'm afraid you're right, so we have to follow your own uh, interpretation of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the negotiation. Thank you. All right, Mark, now you have the closing one. Yeah. Okay, uh, and I'll and try to keep this uh, brief. I mean, I uh, accept uh, both points 100%. In, in the paper, I actually um, I have a section where I uh, treat promises as a kind of pathology of distrust. 
Um, and the reference to um, uh, the senior George Bush's um, uh, pro campaign promise, uh, read my lips, no to new taxes, was that it uh, locked him into a rigid promise in such a way that he could not serve the uh, interests of the nation. Right? And, and that's what you get when you have this um, uh, uh, atmosphere of distrust that then kind of requires something that looks like contracts. And may maybe the analogy here, is, as, as every uh, sort of business school person knows, you don't have contracts to regulate the way people do business. You have contracts for the uh, few cases that blow up, right? And trust is doing most of the work um, uh, sort of within the shell of the guarantees created by the contract. And we want something like that to go on with respect to, to politics as well. Uh, otherwise, we get uh, these piles of, of silly promises that have very little relationship to the problems that are uh, uh, supposedly being addressed. Um, uh, as to your point, um, uh, yes, I accept that. Accept it 100%. Uh, uh, we uh, again, uh, we want to refer back to uh, maybe Jan Elster's uh, 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 talk yesterday uh, about the civilizing for force of hypocrisy. Um, the problem here is not to sort of get rid of insincerity in politics, even though, again, uh, this is a standard that will continue to be applied by everyday people to uh, politics and political speech, but rather to create incentive structures so that uh, people uh, become, I'm sorry, uh, political people, strategic people, uh, become committed to what they say as a consequence of having said it, right? There's a kind of recursive uh, element to this. And good institutions sort of pick up on that recursivity and transform it into something more productive. All right, so I suppose more <laughs> 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 <laughs>